Okay, please go ahead. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the November 28, 2023 Finance Committee meeting. And it's about uh, five minutes after 2 p.m. calling the meeting to order. And uh, first thing that I'd like to do is just to remind everybody that this meeting is being held by Zoom um, according to current rules of the open meeting law and uh, members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom. And But I need to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded both for video and audio uh, purposes and uh, so that everyone is on notice that it is a recorded meeting. I'm now going to um, go through the members of the committee to make sure that everybody can hear and we can hear them. And uh, then we'll uh, proceed with the uh, order of the agenda that's proposed that I want to propose. So um, start with Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Holloway. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Uh, I'm, of course, present. And Alicia, I don't believe is here yet, but we'll keep an eye out for her and check that she can uh, hear and be heard at that time. Um, so having said that, what I want to do, uh, first of all, is to uh, propose that our primary um, discussion today, oh, wait a minute, Alicia, we check to make sure that everybody else can participate. We want to make sure that you can hear us, we can hear you. Yes, I can. Thank you, Andy. Okay, thank you. So we we have not actually uh, done anything. I was just about to um, start with the proposed agenda, which is to focus um, primarily and possibly entirely on the library. Um, and uh, the, if we can make as much progress and totally complete to a recommendation today, that would free us up because we had two other big items for our Friday meeting then, which would be the uh, rental registration and getting onto the discussion of the um, proposed guidelines that we would submit to the council for council consideration of the budget guidelines for FY25. So the way I would propose to do it is that the most complex document today uh, for, for initial consideration was the cash flow, the updated cash flow analysis. And um, I want to thank Lynn for doing a tremendous amount of work uh, with a number of people. She'll talk about the process possibly when she does the presentation, but ask her to present it. And she will be putting it, I believe, on the screen to illustrate what she did, the key points. Uh, but uh, then um, open that up for questions from the committee. The second thing that I want to do is Alicia had re um, requested a number of documents, one that only became available uh, about an hour ago, and it is uh, is going to be added to the packet. Um, that's something that Athena does, so I don't know when, but what, it, what she was asking for was a list of debt that has been previously authorized but has not been issued. Um, that information is now available, and so we'll put that on the screen and present it, give an opportunity to ask for questions. The third thing that I want to do is to go through the Q&A document that was added to the packet um, I, either late yesterday or this morning, probably this morning, um, and contains um, all the answers to a lot of the questions that were presented. Um, and uh, it, so that's going to be the first section of the meeting. The reason that I'm proposing to put public comment after that is 
that a number of members of the public had either requested or uh, from what I looked at the participant list for people who were involved in providing information for the list. So I uh, wanted to make sure that we had all of the information that was available out to the committee so that members of the public could see that information before we do public comment because their comments might be um, affected by the information that's presented and discussed. I would then come back to the committee for additional discussion after that, and we'll then do a check on where we are as a committee um, in uh, how this is proceeding. So um, if that's an agreeable, I'll pause for a moment to see if anybody has any questions or suggestions about that. And otherwise, we'll uh, just proceed in that direction. So seeing no other request to do anything else. I'm going to turn the meeting. Oh, Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, is it possible to just keep public comments first? Um, we can keep public comment first, but um, then the public would not have the opportunity to see things, including the document that you had requested of uh, unissued debt, and they won't um, they won't have the opportunity to hear some of our initial discussion. Um, so that would be the reason to push it later. The only reason to come earlier is if you, you know, if somebody is aware of uh, a member of the public who um, is not going to be here for the duration of the meeting. So what do you think, Alicia? Yeah, that would be my only concern. Um, just because of the timing of this meeting, I know it's like midday on a weekday and that some people come just for public comment and can't actually stay for the meeting. And while I definitely appreciate what you're saying, Andy, I don't I don't even think that th that would be enough time for them to review any new documents anyhow for like a substantial change to whatever it is they might want to share with us. Um, so if others are in agreement, I would be in favor of just keeping public comment first, um, if that's possible. Um, if public comment goes on for a long period of time, we may not have an opportunity to come back for a second public comment that's then informed by the, dis by the information presented. Uh, so I'm going to actually um, ask that you, since that we have one hand up, I don't want to exclude that uh, input. We'll let uh, we'll, we'll see about the uh, people who have, but be aware that we may not come back to public comment if we do public comment now. Tony uh, Cunningham, could you bring Tony into the room since she was the first one who raised her hand? Hi, Tony. Hi, thank you. Yes, I agree. It's a terrible time to ask people to hang on to an unspecified time in the future for public comment. Last year, week, it was an hour and 40 minutes before you held it, and it's the middle of the workday. So um, if I could make my comments now, I would appreciate it. Um, please uh, go ahead and offer your comment. Uh, and I'm sorry that you're missing that one piece of information you may have been interested in, but uh, in any event, please offer your comment. Thank you. So I saw the new cash flow document in the packet today, which shows the library share being paid much sooner than was shared at your last meeting. It's important to understand how likely this is and when the library is legally obligated to transfer funds to the town. The new cash flow has the library paying its full share by July 2026, effectively in a two year window. However, in documentation and comments by the trustees and fundraisers recently, a three-year window has been mentioned, with the bulk of the payments coming at the end of the project in June 2027 or later. Some sources are also contingent on other things, such as raising the $4 million match for the Humanities Grant and hitting energy targets for the Mass Save Incentive. To my knowledge, this cash flow is not a legally binding document, but rather an illustration of a best-case scenario. What is a legally binding document is the amended Memorandum of Agreement, and my reading is that the library is not obligated to pay their share until a year after a certificate of occupancy is issued in mid to late 2027. 
Will the council be presented and vote on a revised memorandum of agreement that would require the library to meet this much earlier schedule of payments? What would be the consequences of missing these dates or amounts, since presumably it would mean larger loans and higher interest payments? How can you assure taxpayers that this schedule will be followed and the town will not end up paying more than is stated in this memo from the town manager? Two other lines caught my eye in attachment A, <clears throat> capital campaign expenses of more than $1 million and Jones interest expenses of $170,000, bringing the total project cost to 47.32 million. Is the town expected to pay this additional, additional 1.2 million? If yes, how is that consistent with the promise of 15.8 million and not a penny more? I can think of many more critical capital needs that the town could use 1.2 million for. Lastly, we still haven't seen the impact of the library borrowing on the five-year capital plan and what projects and purchases would be deferred because we have to pay substantial debt service for the library, nor have we seen the financial model to understand the impact on capital reserves and on the timeline for the fire station and DPW projects. Related to this is the debt limit and how much debt capacity that authorizing borrowing for the library project would consume. Until just now, that information hadn't been provided. So I had looked up assessed property values and current authorized debt in the state's data bank. If my calculations are correct, even after I remove the authorization for the school project, as is allowed per MGL, the council has already authorized 77% of the 146 million debt limit. If I count the school, we are 40% above the debt limit. If this supplemental bond for the library is authorized, it looks to me like we would be at 84% of the debt limit, leaving less than 24 million debt capacity. I assume we would not be able to build a fire station or a DPW for less than 24 million. So please help me understand how we would be able to move forward on either project in the next five years. A recommendation to approve the supplemental bond authorization is stating that the library expansion is more important than the fire station, the DPW and all critical capital needs. There is not evidence that we can afford them all. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I also see that uh, Pamela Rooney has uh, a hand up. So I wanted, Pamela, hi. Thank you. And I didn't know if this was going to be a joint meeting of the council today or not. So I signed in, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, Tony Cunningham just had a, uh, a really clear, concise array of questions that I would also love to, to hear answered. Um, I just wanted to focus on three things, um, the capacity to authorize more debt, the actual debt costs, and I'm, again, hoping that some of that information is going to be discussed uh, in this meeting. Uh, as I, if I looked at the Unibank uh, spreadsheet and the grand total, the grand totals for each of those years, I assume, comes then out of our cash capital. And so that's, a, just want to clarify that. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to note that, in fact, we did not want to use our reserves for the school to bring the school debt down. But in fact, if we have to make up the difference between uh, cash capital or the deficit of cash capital because of additional loans, uh, we are, in essence, using our reserves to um, to promote and to carry the the Jones costs. Um, the second was just uh, actually, I think uh, Tony covered it. It was the authorized debt amount. Um, do we have do we have any more than twenty three or twenty four million dollars capacity with that expanded uh, debt authorization that we're being asked for? And does that, in fact, cover the cost of a CPW? Um, and the third item, which caught my eye as I was rereading the MOA, is that item number four, it's on page two of three, um, basically says the project can go forward uh, under the following circumstances. A, if the town council appropriates funds to cover all eligible costs, and B, if the town manager determines at his or her sole discretion that the project is financially feasible. And so I have to ask the question, um, does Paul Bockelman have the authority to proceed with this project, whether the council votes it or not? Thanks. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who is, um, 
in the audience now who is, wants to make public comments since we've opened this window. If I don't see any hands going up, then we're gonna, we'll go back to where we were previously. Okay, well, at that point, we'll close public comment now. If we can come back to it, we'll see how we go with time today. But um, and I do see that there are other members of the council who are present uh, to answer Pam's question on that. It was not posted as a joint meeting this time. So uh, we can't bring more people into the room than would uh, pass to the quorum. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn uh, to uh, present the cash flow analysis, and she might be able to answer or uh, respond to some of the questions that were uh, posed. So Lynn. Thank you. Um, this is a memo from uh, the town manager. It comes directly out of a meeting that we were able to finally schedule yesterday holiday intervening. Uh, that meeting, as the memo states, included uh, myself, Councillor Kathy Shane, and the town manager, and the capital campaign co-chairs, Kent Farber and Lee Edwards, who was also a member of the library trustees, and the Jones Library trustee and treasurer, Bob Pam, and capital campaign staff, Jenny Hamilton. And I want to just note that all of those people are either in the room are in the audience. And so at some point, if uh, they, um, I need them to explain something further, I really want them to make sure they raise their hands. We started by going back to the cash flow that you saw on November 7, 19th, I think it was. Uh, and in that cash flow, there was a estimate and it was rough and it was hurried about the um, campaign cash flow. And we had, did not have a chance to consult with the trustees on the cash flow at that point. So yesterday we did have that opportunity. And the first thing that we did was look at this spreadsheet and I've tried to make it as large as I can, okay? And I want to uh, particularly draw attention. The first part of this spreadsheet is the costs, well, it's the project phases. And the yellow lines are when building actually starts. And that's when you start paying a lot of money, okay? The second is the costs associated with that building. And the third is the actual income, okay? And then ultimately, this leads into a cash flow, which is in the next two pages, and that leads into a borrowing schedule. So let me just, I'm not going to get into the costs because that is part of the construction documents, and I'm not the building committee. Uh, but as we looked at the costs, one of the things that I think people have not always understood is that we are already sitting with 2.76 million in the town that has come from the Mass, uh, Bo Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And in addition to that, uh, the library has also paid the town an additional half million dollars. So we are, we are not in a position at this point where we need to borrow anything, okay? So this top line right here shows when MBLC will be paying us what and the cumulative amounts of that. The second line, MBLC 1.7 million, shows that there is in fact a sixth payment that will come at the end of the project. In fact, we have reason to believe MBLC may be paying that payment in advance. Those payments keep flowing at all throughout the project on an annual basis. The town of Amherst commitment is right here, followed by the CPA commitment. And then we get into, well, how is the fundraising gone? So they had the historic tax credits right now. 
the estimate with those using the appropriate discounting from what I understand from Bob Pam is about 1.8 million. Then we have the foundation and corporate. And right now that's already started coming in. And so that is that whole line across. This is based, this line and all of the entrances into this line are based on schedules, based on already received funds or received commitments. The state grants, it's the same thing. That's based on re received commitments. The federal grants, it's the same thing based on received commitments. Some of those federal, one of those federal grants doesn't quite require a match, but in fact, all of the money that's up above here, it can be used as part of the match. So the match is there. Then we go to actually the capital campaign. And this first line is received or committed. In other words, this represents the money that the library has already received. And so we look at, for instance, in as of June of, two, of, of uh, 2024, they will have received 1.79 million. The next line basically then says, well, what do they th then still need to raise? And that allows us to go all the way to the end and see, well, there that is the final amount of money so that the collective set of this money offsetting the income is the money that pays for the project. And the one thing that was asked earlier, and that is the campaign expenses, and that is calculated in here, and that is at the expense of the library. Okay, That's normal thing for campaign process. So I want to make sure that before we leave this page, there if there are questions, and this is where I would really like Lee and um, Bob Pam and Ken Farber to potentially be available to weigh in if there are questions. But Andy, I can't see the questions. I can't see raised hands. Kent, I do see that Kent has raised his hand and so has Kathy. You're muted, Andy. I'm sorry, Kathy, go ahead. Um, as, as Lynn mentioned, I was in the room when this was presented to us. Um, so I, I asked this question, basically, I guess it was yesterday. So I'll ask it again. Um, I know there's been a, a good faith effort to say how soon we can get which money. So what I asked yesterday was Amherst underneath this is Amherst College is paying their million in four separate installments, 250, 250 250 each of four years in a row. Um, could that be accelerated? My other question was around uh, the NEH grant, which is Tony just mentioned, there's a matching requirement to secure that full amount, but it sounded like we're pretty near to that match depending on, and given the way they count it. So would it be possible to get it sooner? And I'm asking it because what at, when you're completely through, through Lynn, mm -hmm. um, I want to take a quick look at my rough calculation of our five-year capital budget. And, and the, the critical years are 25 and 26, where we were already in a deficit. And I, um, in terms of it wasn't completely balanced, and we had dropped spending on roads to 600,000 a year in each of those years. So, so getting some of this sooner means it's what you're going to show on the next sheet is we have to incur less short-term debt. Um, right. And it's the short-term debt that will be added to our capital budget. So just to what, to anything that can be accelerated to be, received by the town in 2025 or 2026, rather than waiting till the end of those time periods helps. So those are the two I know. I mean, I know with as yet to come campaign funds, you can't necessarily, you can't accelerate them. You can make a best guess on when they're going to come in, but on anything that 
could come in sooner. Then my, my final question is the same thing, is if we wanted to lower our, our interest rate bearing, could the endowment give us a piece of money knowing they're going to get paid it back earlier and not not a really bit not all of it a piece of it so it's those three separate questions um on a uh, focus on 25 and 2025 and 2026 Andy I see that I do see that Kent Farber yeah. end up I'll bring and Kent in. please so it's up to Athena, I believe. I'm on it. He's coming in. Ken? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I just want to be clear that the line received or committed represents our expectation of cash received from commitments that have been made in writing. So the, we feel confident about those as confident as we can possibly be. The amount expected to be raised is the cash that we expect to receive from new commitments. The, the, the pacing of those is plausible, um, we think it's likely, but there's no way to be as certain about that as the received or committed cash. And we should also make it clear that in the, the foundation and corporation line and the state grant and federal grant line, there is a, a cash expectation there from additional grants to be received. We think there are um, lots of possibilities for additional fundraising there. So we've built some additional amounts in there beyond what has already been committed. Okay. Are there other questions on this before we, I mean, Kathy, you asked questions uh, and you did ask them yesterday about acceleration of Amherst College payment. And that was, uh, I think there was an agreement to explore that. The other one was the acceleration of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and there was an agreement to explore that. Uh, what was not discussed yesterday was uh, the idea of the endowment use, being used as a way to pay, knowing the money would be coming back. And I think that's a down the road discussion, but others may want to hear more about that. Okay. Are there any other questions on this? I guess my related question on this would be uh, whether um, consideration was given to using the balance in our uh, inter our, our fund, our uh, capital stabilization fund uh, um, used for funding any parts of this on a short-term basis to avoid having to go out for uh, bans or short-term debt. That was not discussed yesterday. Uh, it's something that certainly could be discussed in the finance committee. Are there other questions? Kathy. Okay, so there was one other thing that came up yesterday and I know um, Nobody in Jones has, has a chance to explore this, but the school from Eversource got a, a construction in, uh, incentive payment, not just a performance incentive payment, because we went to ground source. They also have money on the table to go to air source heat pumps. And I don't know whether the library would qualify for them, but it's different than the mass save incentives um, that they have penciled in. So that that potentially is a source of funds that isn't listed anywhere here um, that I raised for further exploration. For, for the school, it's a substantial amount of money. And we, we went with geothermal, but AirSource would have also paid us if we could hit the EUA I target that was set for schools. 
but it wasn't contingent on hitting it. It was contingent on Eversource believing we could hit it, the construction incentive. And then there was a separate amount that if we hit it, we would get an additional amount of money. So I thought it was something worth exploring. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa. Um, yes, I'm just looking for um, clarification. Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, sorry. I'm just looking for clarification. Um, Lynn, you said that the library will pay the fundraising costs, but the original MOA says that the library will deduct the fundraising costs from their share. And so I'm just wondering if that indicates that there will be a change to the MOA. Um, at this point, Paul, you might want to address this. You've suggested we don't think the MOA needs to be changed at this point, but we, it, by the time we get done with the council vote, it may need to be changed. And your point is this 1.5, 105 million, 1.05 million Oops. is actually part of what will come out of the uh, library fundraising. But they, that's money they will spend before they give us any money. So in other words, that money will never come to the town because they will spend it out of their own money before it come before they pay the town. Does that get it part of your question, Alicia? You're you're still muted. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no. no, I believe sort of, but I think I'm just still wondering if that is indicated in the MOA, like does that need to be indicated or does that mean that then the town is responsible for paying it first? I'm just trying to figure out um, sort of the order of operations here and if that would need to change if we wanted it to happen in a different way. Paul, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, <clears throat> so the town is not paying any of the ca capital campaign expenses. That's not something that we've contracted for, nor are we doing. It's not really reflected in the MOA, and it, it doesn't need to be. It's 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 good to show it here as a potential as a cost because it's a true cost for this project. But the way the MOA is structured is to pay, is to create what the town is going to put in, what the MBLC is going to put in, and the remainder being the library share. And so it's that remain this part of the remainder that re is the library share. Alicia, does that answer your question? Yes, and then just one quick follow up. And so, so when does that indicate? Does that indicate when they would be obligated to pay the town? There, there is a, a deadline in the um, MOA um, that is reflected, I think, on this spreadsheet. But I think the MOA, yeah. I'm sorry, if you don't mind, can you just point it out to me? or let me know. Yeah, hold on. Uh, the payment to the town comes, I'm trying to, uh, hold on. You put the exact words. It, it, it doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. What did you say? I'm, I'm looking for the, it's not reflected here. It's reflected on the next page. This is the cash flow for the library. And then the next page, next two pages, will show when that last payment is due. It's due in 2027, is, my, is what I understand. It's anticipated to be due then, because it's anticipated to be due once occupancy has happened. It, it's one year from the date on which the certificate of occupancy is issued for the project. Right. So, Alicia, I want to take a little more moment here and explain this. So this shows the money as it will be received by the library. It does not show the money as it will pay it to the count, to the town. The next sheet shows the money that it will pay to the town. So you this is, the next sheet? Yeah, Kathy has her hand up on this though. 
Yeah, you're muted now. Yeah, um, Lynn, it actually, the flow is showing the library here received or committed in it, but you have to subtract out the 15.8. So if you go down, if you go down to the bottom line, um, you hit 46 million at one point in terms of, of the cost, but it is, um, you know, that's the expectation of uh, they've closed the gap or they've mortgaged the house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. But the reality is, is yeah. in 2027, whether they have raised all of the money or not, they, the library at that point, owes the town the balance of whatever they have to raise. So that's when that comes due. There's another hand up. Alicia, I think your hand's up again. Yeah, sorry. It's just the same question. I'm just wondering because in the, the fundraising deposit section of the MOA, it says that the library shall deposit with the town treasurer all amounts of the library project donations as and when the same is received by the library, less any direct and reasonable uh, fundraising costs and expenses. Um, the library project. Don yeah. So anyways, that's the section that I'm wondering if we're proposing changes to that or if that will stay the same. That will stay the same. What that basically is saying the library will be raising all of the money that they owe the town plus the money to run the campaign. And what that paragraph means is states is that they will give us money as they receive it, but they will, they are allowed to keep back whatever amount from that money uh, for to fund the ongoing expense of running the capital campaign. But ultimately, they have to pay us everything they owe us, even if they still have expenses from the campaign. So think of the library as having to raise everything that they owe us, plus the amount that it takes to run the campaign. So at no point will the town be expected to pay for the costs of running the campaign. Does that make sense, Alicia? Yes, sorry, please excuse my daughter's singing toy in the background. <laughs> um, but I I, def I understand what you're saying. My only confusion lies in that, that it's not what I understand is being proposed in the MOA. So that's just why I'm asking. So are we saying that we're changing the MOA or are we just saying we're like changing the understanding and the MOA doesn't need to change, but we can change what we're expecting from the trustees without changing the MOA? Uh, oh. I don't think there's any change in the M in any expectations or the MOA. The MOA says that they will give us the funds that they raise, which they've given us 500,000 so far. And so we count five hundred thousand. They have may may have had expenses. They did have had expenses that go along with that that they have retained from their fundraising. So they haven't returned every dime that they've collected to us. They've used some of it for their fundraising expenses. So it doesn't. You know, the MOA their fundraising expenses are our fundraising expenses. We don't have a, a role in that, but they, they thought it was important to show to to show that as part of this total project cost. And, and subsequently, it is also mentioned in the MO, MOA. Kathy, did you have a hand up about this issue? Yes. Okay, please. <laughs> okay, I'll just say it very quickly. I would like you to go to the next page, but I want to reserve the, uh, let's go back to the MOA when we get through this, because I think there's some places it should be tighter, Paul, mm -hmm. so you may think it's yeah. adequate, but to really put it up on the screen, um, yeah. uh, because at the point we wrote it, uh, the the total was lower and the gap mm -hmm. was lower, so I think we could write it tighter than we wrote it last time, but I don't want to take up how to do that now. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I don't want to close that door right now. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Andy, Bob Pam has a hand up in the audience as well. Okay. I, since I'm not looking, uh, bring Bob in.
Bob, are you able to unmute? Okay, um, I was just hoping to make this a little clearer. Um, let me see if I can, okay. Uh, it did not make any sense to raise money, transfer it to the town, then take it back from the town in order to pay a bill. Um, rather than do that, what we said we would do is that we would uh, send over periodically the amount that was raised, uh, less the amount that we needed to, to cover expenses. And that just meant that there was one less transfer, but it did not change the amount that would be going to the town because the amount that goes to the town is the amount necessary to fill whatever the gap is. That was fairly straightforward. I don't think that requires any changes because it's the most practical way to proceed from here on as well. You know, we will raise money. We will transfer to you everything that is that is raised less the expenses of doing the raising. And I think that that's fairly clear in terms of, of what's written there. Um, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Okay. Alicia, is there anything else on that before I go to the next page? Not right this minute. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. We can always come back. Okay, so on the next page, well, this is really two pages. This is where you look at the cash flow. And the main thing that changed here from the version you saw on the 19th is the 500,000 stayed the same. However, this original estimate here, which was rough and I accept full responsibility for it, is now 2 million, okay, right there. The next one is actually 4 million. And the reason that the library is able to do this is because of the success they have been having with their fundraising. So that by the time we get to 2025, it's another 5 million. This number right here represents the balance they will owe us based on the MOA, which is the balance they were always going to owe us. It does not include the fundraising expenses because they've kept that, but it is the full amount they owe us. And what this represents is that starting in FY27, when the MOA comes due, regardless of where the fundraising stands with the library, the trustees will have to figure out and make their own decision as to what, how they will give the town this additional 2.3 million. And I wanna pause here and ask again that Lee Edwards and or Bob um, talk about the discussions that they've already had to look at their options for that. I don't know if, if, I don't know if Lee wants to come in or just have Bob explain it. Bob has raised his hand, so let's go with that. Right, well, I mean, you understand that in fundraising, I can't say that it's going to happen on January 31st. I right. cannot say that it will be 5.00000. It, it, it'll be roughly those numbers and whether it is higher or lower, is always something that depends upon the success of the fundraising. So, um, you know, I have provided these numbers because that is our current estimate of where we will be at that time. And so it's not going to end up as 2,372,518. I you know that's, that is not real. <laughs> but all the rest of it is our best estimates of where we're going to be. Um, and it will be during fiscal 26, it'll be during fiscal 25, it'll be during fiscal 24. All of those are where we are going with this. It is what we believe are realistic. Um, so just, just be clear about it when we talk about projections three years into the future, it is going to always be done in a rounded format. 
because that's the only way to be real right. in the future. Right. Lee did have her hand up. You'd have to bring her in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, only to augment what Bob said in relation to what I thought I heard you were asking. Um, we have been in discussion with local lending agencies, and they have indicated that at the moment that the library needs to have a conversation about making up the difference between what we've raised, we, the fundraising committee has raised, and what the library owes, they are quite willing to enable us to make that happen. And we have provided fairly detailed information about both our status, the status of the project, um, our uh, income and expenses. Um, and we've gotten one response, which was you know, extraordinarily clear about their willingness to proceed. A second one, which was clear about our eligibility to go forward and um, their thought that this is a realistic possibility. Um, but no one should be asked to make a commitment three years into the future about how much and at what interest rate. You know, those, those will always be somewhat hypothetical. What we are doing is trying to make sure that they are as clear as they can be about our finances, about the, the, the our progress in terms of, of raising money and who is doing it and the ways that we think it will work. Um, and they are clear about thinking that this is perfectly re uh, reasonable and doable from their perspective there are, as you know, more than one way for money to be raised. Um, if we can do it directly out of our own funds, we would do it that way. If we can do that with a, uh, uh, a line of credit, we might do it that way. If we did it with a uh, longer term agreement, we would do it that way. It all depends upon what it looks like three years from now. Are there any other questions before I go to the actual bonding? Can I just make, uh, just be clear with, for everybody. So what doesn't change on the spreadsheet is the local share borrowing, which is the town share, the $15.7 million. What doesn't change is the MBLC grant, which is 15.565. Those numbers don't change throughout any of these spreadsheets. Those are locked in. Nor does the million uh, the million from CPA. Or the million for CPA, correct. I'm sorry, that, that's here. Yeah. Okay. So what you also see here, and you're going to see on the next sheet, is at what point do we start borrowing? Okay. This is the point at which we have to start borrowing. And I just want to point out, because most people say, oh, you're going to run out today and you're going to borrow $46 million. No, we're not. We don't have to borrow... The first time we have to borrow is in 2026. And that is because of the cash flow that is provided by the upfront yearly MBLC payments, the money that's coming from CPA, the money that is coming from the contributions of all the different sources. And so you get to the point that we have not incurred any debt until our estimate right now is 2026, okay? The next time we incur debt, because again, you only borrow as much as you need. You don't borrow more than you need. So the next time you incur debt is later in 2026, 25, 26. And then finally down here, ultimately at that point is when you turn it into a long-term borrowing. And that will show in the next sheet but Bob Hegner has his hand up. Yeah, I, I just have a question about oh. the, the the CPA funding. Has that been um, 
do we already have that money set aside or do we have to set it aside? That's a borrowing. It's a borrowing. For, with, with, with funds being paid back from CPA funds. Mm -hmm. That's already been voted by the council. Okay, so so we will do that transfer then according to the schedule at the end of May of 2020, by the end of May of 2024. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a separate repayment schedule under the CPA fund. Okay. Lee Edwards has her hand up again. No, 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 I don't. Oh. Okay. Kathy Shane has her hand up again. So, Lynn, um, comparing these two sheets, the one earlier had us borrowing 15.751 on, on or about uh, May 31st, 2024. Mm -hmm. You're not showing in this next one any debt on that. So are we not borrowing the full 15? So, so I know you don't have to pay it the year you borrow it, but you're not showing it. Um, so I'm just, I'm asking for next. Let me, let me go to the next. Up above it, it actually up above, it says we're borrowing it on May 15th, 2024. So why do yeah. we not see any principal or interest in 2025 and 2026 on that borrowing? Okay. You do see it. So now we're on the, we're on the final page of the cash flow. Okay. This is our this is the town's money right here. Okay. And then this is the short term borrowing. And okay. when you look I'm at just this, I'm just correcting you're saying we're not borrowing anything. We are yeah. borrowing on the big one. Right, it's right. the band you're saying we're not doing the bands, we're not doing the short term till later. That's a, that's absolutely correct. Okay. So at this point, you'll see you start paying on the bands in 2026 and your first payment on the other borrowing is to is right here to 2025 okay and so when you do all of that together what you see is that the total borrowing on the bands is 764,000 Seven seventy dollars and the total borrowing on the overall the big loan which is the town's money is 7.944 the sum total of those two is less than nine million and the only reason it's less than nine million is because of the aggressive successful nature of the fundraising at the library level and if they bring up, it bring money in even faster, these numbers, depending on interest rate, which at this point we're estimating 4%, it could down. become even lower. Lee, you have your hand up. No, I don't. Sorry. Okay. So okay. now let's go back up to the top of the cash flow. Okay. This is this is where we should stop and ask questions about cash flow. By the way, I did not do the cash flow. Our financial advisor did this cash flow with Jennifer, Jen Fontaine, LaFontaine working with him. She is the co-financial director at this point. We don't have that sheet. Is that correct? Oh, you do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, this sheet maybe... is attached to this memo. Okay, maybe I just didn't. Ah. Hmm. I got it. Okay. It, it's It's been in the packet since yesterday. Yeah, no, I just, it's, I, it was an earlier one. Okay. So are there questions on this sheet? We can always come back to it. Matt, you have your hand up. Yeah, Lynn. So first of all, just 
my uh, this is a really, really detailed and clear projection. And so thank you for putting the information together in our hands and for running it through so clearly. Um, maybe I, I misheard. So on the final page, on page five, <clears throat> you have the um, 15.7 borrowing dated at 515.24. But I heard you say a moment ago that borrow. I yeah, I misspoke. I did not. It's twenty. I, it's the same date. It's the same date. You just misspoke. Okay. All right. Thank no. You. So I mean, that's that's how clear everything has been. That's the only question that's come up for me so far. I've I spent a lot of the morning looking at this sheet. It's it's really um, it's really nicely put together. So I'm I'm grateful for for the work. No, well, we have a lot to thank both the library uh, people for putting together this first sheet because we could have never gotten to the second set of sheets without this sheet and without the discussion yesterday. Okay, I'm gonna take this up. Nope, Alicia, hands up. Sorry, I'm just wondering, does this show um, when payments are beginning to be made by the library in 2027? Um. Yes. So if you go down here in the cash flow, uh, the last payment for the library, we would hope would be sometime on or about uh, July 31st, 2026. After that, the library has no more payments coming to us. Okay, so uh, does that answer your question, Alicia? Yes, thank you. Okay. Andy, do you want to go to the next sheet? Yeah, so should we go ahead and go to the other item we were going to uh, put on the screen, which was one that was just produced on the uh, authorized but unissued debt? Yes, I will get that as soon Wait a minute. as the Kathy has her hand up. Let's no, pause. I, I just want people to um this is clearly a better picture than a week ago in terms of the the short term borrowing. But um Andy, you can tell me when, but I want people to understand what the impact is on our capital, on our capital plan. We have a five year capital plan, and so all I have is I have an Excel I took the existing one, and I changed the Jones line to be these numbers. And it's, it's, um, so you can tell me when you want me to show that, but, but I have that to show, and I can only show it through, it was a five-year plan, 24 through 28. So I can't do 29, 30, because we didn't, we only plan five-year chunks. So um, we have to pay the interest out of that flow until we get the rest of it back. So you can tell me when okay. I think what we're going to do at this moment is Alicia asked a number of questions that had to deal with our debt service. Some of those are uh, addressed in the questions, but more importantly, I want to see if I can call this sheet up. Uh, I have it. And I think Paul, you're probably you and Jen um, mm -hmm. are the two that are most able to speak to this one, right? Should I actually be Holly, I think. <clears throat> oh, Holly, I'm sorry. Yeah, so Holly is here as well. Um, so what the question was, was how much debt is on the town's books right now and how much of it have we borrowed and how much of, of it have we not borrowed? Um, Holly, we heard you. Um, so what this, if you want to scroll down, Lynn, what it shows is, um, let me actually stay up there for a second. We'll go, I just want to go through the columns. So the first... Um, the first column is purpose is what we borrowed it for. The second is when the vote was taken to borrow that money. And it, with the, refer the, the third article number is the reference. It references a town meeting article or a council order. The amount authorized is the next column. And then if the, we issued it, if we retired it, or if we rescinded it, that is that column. And that means it comes off of our books one way or the other. And then the next one is unissued inside the debt limit, which is amounts of money that 
um, you can have it inside the debt limit or outside the debt limit. And the state um, calculates our debt capacity based on whether it's inside the debt limit or outside the debt limit. Um, so, and I'll just go down to the first two to show you. So uh, the initial was PEG audiovisual equipment. This was something that we had made an agreement with um, uh, um, Amherst Media. If they needed money up front, that we would agree, we agreed to borrow the funds. They didn't need it. Uh, so that money is there. Um, it, but that would be inside the debt limit. The next item was the water lines on Northampton Road. And because it's a water project, that's outside the debt limit because it's one of the reasons, and it's, it's how the state calculates it. Um, it's because it's paid off by water water funds. It doesn't come out of the general obligation funds. So, um, and, that, and so I highlighted the library expansion project down there in whatever that color is, the 35, 279, 700 is what we had originally authorized. Um, and this is where the question is, does the council wanna make that number larger, which is the $46 million? That's the question before the council. And so if you can scroll down to the total, and the big, the big, big one here is the, the two big ones are the Centennial Water Treatment Facility, which is 21.5 million. Um, which is on the next, on that lower page, Lynn. Um, and you'll see some things that we borrowed, we had debt authorization, then we rescinded the borrowing and borrowed a different amount based on new information. So the, the number we're working with was Centennial's 21.5 million, and that's outside the debt limit. And then the big one is the Fort River School um, authorization, um, uh, which is um, outside the debt limit as well. Um, so inside the debt limit, we have a $46 million authorization. Outside the debt limit, we have 118 million. And note that the, the Fort River School is um, uh, um, also excluded from the limits of Prop 2.5. And, and I think this is important, Paul, because earlier somebody, uh, I think might have been Tony, was using a much different number about where we are with our debt limit. And the reality is of our debt limit that's inside, we are only at this number, the 46. And Holly, is there anything you want to add to this? Uh, no, I was also just going to point out that, again, there were some that were authorized and rescinded for different dollar amounts. So where those ones are zeroed out, I think it was the Centennial Water Treatment Plant, the Gravity Belt Thickener. Um, and then to just to also point out here that with both the Fort River School and the Jones Library, again, we have to authorize the full borrowing, but by the time we get around to doing the borrowing, that is going to free up a lot of this money. Um, we're not borrowing a full 92 million on the, on the Fort River School. We're not borrowing the full $46,000 on the library. So those numbers will come down as soon as the permanent borrowings are done. And then the balance of those articles um, to be rescinded, to be zeroed out. And, and there will be a couple items, if you, if you can scroll up, Lynn, that will come to the yeah. council for rescission. <laughs> we'll ask the council to rescind the borrowing authorization. Um, yeah. For instance, the if you look at the, um, where is it? Um, the very first one, the PEG. Yeah, the 410 and then and, the 450 for the North Common parking lot, because there's a new plan for that parking lot. So those two will likely be coming in the spring. And it is possible that the 800,000 for the water lines on Northampton Road, um, I believe that project came in under and that that will be um, at least a portion of that will be rescinded as well. So come the spring, you'll see those come off our books. And that frees up money. It doesn't free up yes. any money. It's just a borrowing authorization. It frees up borrowing authorization. Yeah. Thank borrowing. you. So I guess, Andy, we want to see if there's questions on this. Okay. Are there? No. Any. Okay. So uh, Kathy had a request about uh, talking about the five-year plan. Uh, 
question, of course, is also, which you can talk about too, is how how they relate uh, to the borrowing. Is uh, not sure that that it does, but yeah, I think why don't I turn it over to you for a couple of minutes? Yeah. So before I put the the spreadsheet up, what the five year capital plan does is when we say ten point, we're at ten point five percent of the general fund they, from the year before. We're allocating toward capital. When we say what do we have available to spend in the current year, we have to subtract the debt service from existing debt. So that's principal and interest payments. So that leaves us an amount that's available for anything new, including new borrowing, but it could be to buy a vehicle, to repair a building, to, and Paul, if I say something <laughs> that's wrong, I'm doing, it. so that gives us, so, so there is a total flow of funds in, and then we have an expenditure budget. So what, if I can show my screen, uh, let me just. Uh, Athena, are you still here? Yep, she can share her screen. Thank you. Okay, so what I did is, this is the five-year plan that's posted on our website right now. And I've just showed you, so this is literally, I just copied and pasted the numbers. You know, I didn't have the Excel. So this was the revenues coming in from a variety of sources. And then um, this was the debt line. And what I did is I indented Jones. We'd always put Jones in there. So Jones was in for 1.155, 1 million. And it, it just think of it all the way out that in this direction, it's, it's a 20 year debt. And um, there was other debt underneath this. So this wasn't the only debt we had, although as you'll see, um, we've got DPW coming on out here and we also have some planned, some projected debt. So we were gonna do Crocker Farm roof. We were gonna do the Crocker Farm HVAC system. We have a whole list of what's underneath these numbers. So this was the amount left over for other projects, other things new um, that if we hadn't done the debt already. And just I put this as an indent. Oh, Rhodes is in here. We were able in the current year to allocate 1.3 million to Rhodes, but the 25 budget we always thought would be tighter. So we've just put in 600,000. That doesn't count the chapter 90 money, but this was out of our cash capital. Um, so our budget was not balanced in 25 and 26. It's not a lot over, but it was a little bit over with what we said we wanted to do in those years. So what I did then was forget this line. This was the new line as of last week. Um, so this is, this is the, this line right here. Let me make it whatever, just where I just highlighted it. That's the number that Lynn just gave us. Uh, for each of these years. So it's in compared to the 1155, 1378. The big year is the second year where it was 11155 and 1748. So that is an increase in principal and interest debt service. And this year is the biggie, 600,000. And all I want to do with this is says it leaves less for everything else. Um, so th that's just the world will be living in and so we would we as a town would have to say are there other things we can postpone and move to another year or are there other sources of money to get some of the things in the pipeline such as ARPA money <laughs> that we know we want to do these things and let's go ahead and do them but out of the current capital plan we started with a deficit in these and this is 25 and 26 so this jump up of an increase of about 600,000. And this increase combines the two, the Lynn gave us a total in the one thing. So it's that short term debt, the interest, and it's beginning to pay principal and interest on the big loan that's starting to hit us in these um, revised numbers in here. So that all I wanted to say is we have to think about that. I'm not saying that <laughs> determines the decision, um, because it definitely squeezed. So the, this net remaining, that's vehicles, that's building repair, that's the um, work we've been doing to 
uh, take an old boiler system and replace it with an HVAC system that's electrical, um, that is roads. And we've been allocating a million. So we don't have a lot of wiggle room for another 500,000. Some of this is just pure interest rates. Interest rates are higher now than they were, but some of this is the amount is total. And that's all. I just, all of this assumes is the trustees will give us all the money they are obligated to. So we're not on the hook for any more. And that was why I asked the question earlier of anything that could be accelerated in, in this time period um, lowers the interest that we would be paying, not on our 15, but on the other amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. That's all. I just wanted to show that picture because another 600,000 is a that actually equals the total amount of money we were planning on spending on roads, but it, it has to come from somewhere. That's it. Okay. Let's, um, I see Paul and then uh, Bob Hegner in that order. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's, well, first off, I, I wouldn't equate the number to roads because we will not be reducing the roads amount. It will be no, something yeah, else. I but, I, but I think, Kathy, you're spot on in identifying a problem that we're going to have to work. It's a manageable problem because we have some tools to work on it with. Like you have already suggested some really good ones like accelerating payments. Um, you know, we have our capital stabilization fund, which we can always dip into if need be. Uh, we have um, ARPA funds that we can allocate. And then we always, you know, we just did a, the council just appropriated a million dollars for roads recently out of our free cash, you know, because you are recognizing the need for roads and you're accelerating that beyond what is in the capital stabilization plan. It doesn't show, that doesn't show up on our capital improvement program, that additional work that we do every year, which we've been putting in an additional million dollars on roads. So it's, um, I think we have to recognize that the council is doing a lot more on roads than shows up in our capital improvement program. And we have to do a whole lot more. So I just, but I think what, I'm really glad that you're putting this on the table because it's gonna be a hard discussion where I'm already prepping our department heads about expectations coming year, about vehicle expectations for the coming year, um, you know, and we're all in the in the investment we need to make in our existing buildings because we can't fall behind on those kinds of investments, and it it in order to stay up with our climate um, goals, especially, but also just the buildings need investment as well, but. I'm really glad that you're highlighting this because I think the finance committee and JCPC are going to really have to work this hard this year. And and so Bob, I can take yours. I, tell me when I can stop screen sharing because I was just I was just showing that it's you can stop uh, from my no, point. No, no, no. Actually, Kathy, you could you scroll up a little bit? Um, so you have um, in uh, row 14, you have the debt exclusion for the school, and you're sort of counting that in as part of the um, the the capital. But Bob, uh, what I didn't show is I didn't show I didn't show all the revenue lines. The debt exclusion line is both an expense and a revenue. Okay. You know? Yeah. You know, so okay. That's that's in this revenue line. I just thought it would be too confusing, and it's similarly CPA money. There's there's a revenue and an expenditure, but it's not a net to us. Okay. Um, so so the the total revenues then is a combination of what we set aside for uh, for capital, and then as well as these other sources. Yeah, correct? and I and I sh I should have I just. I was typing these in and I'm no. really bad at typing accurately. So <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I just, I just needed to understand. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Okay. So I saw no other hands up. Um, Alicia has her hand up. Oh, Alicia, you're, yeah, you do. I'm just wondering if Kathy can, is that shareable? It, uh, I was, thank you so much, Alicia. We, we decided we, it came in so late, it will now be added to the packet literally right now. Okay, yeah. great. And I, I think that was really helpful. And, I, and I'm glad that you did that, Kathy, because I think a lot of my concerns and why I've, I'm looking at this and trying to figure out is how this will impact 
our ability to do other projects? Like, will it move the the date of the fire station and the date of the DPW and when those things can actually be accomplished? And will it affect our reserves that, you know, we've been saying we're saving for those projects? Um, and will it affect our operating budget if money doesn't come in on time from the library? And we're, you know, I think somebody said, well, then they're obligated to pay us. But if they didn't fundraise enough and they use from the endowment, then do we have to pick up for operating costs? Um, and so like, those are the the things that I want to see. And so I think I just essentially, there's no question here. Just, I would like to see that document. And thank you, Kathy, for putting that together. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Kathy, let me, let yeah me just, you need I, to I've, send that to, to Athena to add to the packet. Okay, I just want to date it. But um, Alicia, the, the thing you're not seeing, because I just did the five-year plan is, the our debt if the library pays us off as is expected the debt for dpw doesn't show up until after they've paid it off so we had this 10-year debt and interest um so it is not in that dpw doesn't appear in those five years i went and double checked this to see what we had online so we have we're buying some equipment there, um, there are a couple things two years from now, I mentioned Crocker Farm that were on the list, um, but uh, I will send you what I will call my messy sp spreadsheet, and I'm just going to send it to Athena, and Athena, you can save it as a PDF, because otherwise, you know, it's a, it has some formulas, um, and for those who, anyone who really wants to see the long-term, long-term, our annual capital plan that Paul and everyone posts, the last page of it has all our expected debt and interest payments with 10 years of it. I mean, it, the town has done a really nice job of showing us paying off some debt. And when things come along, we fired ladder truck, there's there's stuff on it, but I will, I will send it. Um, Athena, would you also add the um, overall debt thing that Holly just reviewed with us? And Paul. Yes. Thank you. So yes. Andy, I guess, do you want to go on to questions? Yeah, I think we'll go to Q&A and I um, just will pose one question real quickly to Bob Parent is do you have a time limit that we want to make sure that we get to the questions that are relevant to you out of order? Okay. I'm here to the end. Okay. Then back to you, Ben. Okay. So um, let me just do this. Um, so various people, uh, counselors and others from the public have asked a, a variety of questions, okay? And in the packet, as of about mid-morning today, we had our best ability to respond. I will say that one of the additional things we've already looked at wasn't available, but it, it responds to the whole issue of what does our present debt look like? And that's, you'll see later on. So what we tried to do here uh, is lay out the question and lay out the response. So the first one was about a cash flow for the first four capital projects. And I, I wanna, put this answer in a couple different ways. First of all, Kathy has done her own estimate. And I think we all agree that we're very grateful for that and thankful. Paul, you have mentioned, I believe that we are working on an update uh, of that, of the model, if you will. Mm -hmm. But your estimate at this point is, do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, so we, I had conversation. We've been engaging with Sean Magano on this because he put the spreadsheet together, which is where I want him for, with his eyes. And I think we, um, and, but I asked him just, you know, looking at what the new information we had. And this was his comment was that there he, is just the time value of money um, for an, an additional $10 million um, that it didn't, he didn't see is going to be substantially different. I mean, the, the um, I mean, it, so yeah, so that's, that, this is basically his response, and in the in the up we haven't updated the interest rates on that yet, right? 
in addition to that, um, the question, part of this question was, will the project, school project incur any bans during construction? And we assume yes, but you're in the process of doing an update based on the 9.7 million that we just got. And, the, and an updated construction cost that we have from the OPM. So our financial advisor, David Eisenthal is pulling that together. That will, we have a, we have a, a cash flow projection. It did not uh, call out the bands in particular, like we did with the library project. So we've asked him to pull that together. That um, would include the bands, just a spreadsheet, much like you have for the library project. Okay. Thanks. Costs and um, recent. And MSBA grant. MSBA grant. Paul, just, yep. just, I, I know this complicates the thing, but um, we also uh, did some assumptions about reserves in there, and Chon's original did or didn't do that. So he should just check, you know, in terms okay. of having, he should just check on what Sean's original did. Because I know Sean's original didn't have us with the large principal and interest happening for a few years, we had some short term. So mm -hmm. you should just. Okay. 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 Um, and then the next one was please provide an updated cash flow. And we've done that. That's the big memo that we just did at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, and then, uh, then we get into the issue of the basic costs of the repair. And this is where Bob parent has been, particularly active in providing this. And uh, there was a memo already developed. Here's the link to that memo that tells you uh, what we're estimating the basic cost, basic repairs to Jones would cost. And it is between 19 and 21 million, but that does not include asbestos abatement or uh, meeting the um, energy codes. And this was a very long and thoughtful <laughs> response that Bob provided. That's a Bob parent answer. Yeah. Very detailed. It depends. Yes. Um, okay. So then the next question was, um, what about what is the recommended not to exceed debt limit? And this is where uh, we just looked at that whole debt limit page that um, Holly prepared. And um, the uh, existing big debts, as we mentioned, are the water treatment center and the library. And then this is the citation that shows that the school debt is excluded. The next question was about the bans and the question that was question here was if we uh, use reserves to cover the bands, does that hurt our bond rating? And Paul, I think I'm going to turn to you on that one. Now they look at our, our actual indebtedness, and you know, as we as Jen and Holly manage our debt, our, our cash flow, they don't really borrow the money if we if we have enough cash flow, unless they absolutely need it. So they don't won't issue ban they do projections with um, our David Eisenthal. And then if they deem that they need money before, you know, as our cash flow goes through the course of the year, then they will they will utilize bans. Okay. And bans can be secured on pretty they're there's some sometimes called state house notes where they're short term borrowings. You don't need the documentation that you need for a formal borrowing. Um, but we share all this information with the bond rating agencies and they all need in our bond council who looks at everything before we do anything. Then the next question was, given the state's given us 10 million new funding, should we consider pulling back the 5 million from the school project to fund other capital projects. And uh, this is a council discussion. It's a discussion, Andy, that, uh, you know, the um, the finance committee may wanna have. Uh, we did pull in 5 million uh, based on the hope that we will get reimbursement uh, for sustainability efforts. 
Um, and did you want to speak any further to that, Andy? Uh, only to the minor to the point that uh, we had talked about at the council level, um, asking Paul to consider uh, raising five million additional dollars, and that five million was really was covered by the ten million dollars. And he commented on that in his report at recent council meeting. So that part of that money has already been planned for if you follow that out. Kathy? I just want, I'm. this is a longer discussion because I just want to say the, the great news about the 10 million is it will reduce the taxpayer increase. Um, and I wouldn't want to do anything that changes that message. Um, so that's just, that's, that's because we actually put it out that way um, and people were thrilled to hear that message. Yeah. Um, but but to be clear, we could do it if we wanted to. Right. We could do legally, it. If we legally, we could do it. I think it, whether we should do it and could do it are the two questions we're talking about. That, that's all I'm saying. And is if we can, if the federal direct payments come in really fast and we have a way of paying down any indebtedness, you know, this was just a cleaner way of not taking on the debt in the first place um, and replacing it. But in any case, I just said that it was a statement, uh, a viewpoint. <laughs> so one of the questions um that has come up is about staging and where does the construction company stage from? And I have to say that yesterday in our conversation with the library, Paul, you gave one of the more complete answers on this. So either you or uh, Bob may want to address this one. So I'll kick off and Bob can add more. Um, so the, it, staging is an important piece of the um, construction process, which is, you know, we even had a conversation today with the OPM and, and designer about where to put a, const, uh, a construction, you know, uh, um, trailer. Um, what the town has suggested is, and this will be all reviewed by the planning board, and if it requires the use of the public way, then it would be the town council as well. So with the, with the, what our plan is at this moment uh, is to utilize some of the sidewalk the, in front of the building and some of the parking spaces uh, in front of the building uh, as sort of a entry area and construction zone um, to they will need some easements on uh, from private property owners which would they're you know, the that were they're negotiating with right now including the historical society um, Immediately behind the library is the CVS owned parking lot. I mean, if the if the contractor wants to address, go to CVS and talk to them, that's up to that contractor. Um, there is a small portion of our town owned parking lot up by the church uh, that we could use as a lay down area. We wouldn't use all the parking back there clearly. We also have the VFW site, which the town now controls, which is just down the road which is a pretty large parcel of land that could be used as a laydown site. And what a laydown site is, is when you get material delivered, you don't need it right away. You need to put it somewhere and they just need space for that. And they like it to be on site, but this site is a very tight site and it's not going to be, op that's not going to be an option, but um, they might get a big delivery of bricks or whatever, and they could put them down there as a, until they need them. Bob, do you have more you want to add to that? Uh, the only other thing I would add, Paul, is that we expect that the, demolition portion of the project will obviously go first. And what that'll do is we'll open up additional on-site space that over time the contractor will work themselves out of. So in the short term, when the greatest number of materials and things like that will be coming up, they'll be staging likely on-site. And then as the need for staging decreases, the availability of on-site staging will also decrease. And Paul, you mentioned yesterday that as we've been doing the Pomeroy intersection, mm -hmm. how did we resolve staging there? So the contractor, uh, we agreed to have the contractor stage some of their equipment at uh, Hickory Ridge because we have that big parking lot there. Um, we segmented off a piece of that and he used, the contractor used that um, when they did Northampton Road. Um, 
they used different locations uh, that they obtained uh, from neighboring property owners, and that was upon the that's that's up, up to the contractor to to utilize, and this is like to store their large vehicles and stuff. This is not going to this is not a road project, so you don't have big pavers or anything like that that are, that's involved in this project. You do have other equipment, clearly. Um, the next question was talking about the building and what's who's responsible for in, interior design and accessibility. And Paul, this involves a town department. It's I think that's Bob. That would be Bob. Yeah, I think. Bob, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is the three steps, Bob. Yeah, my understanding and and. Perhaps maybe even if Sharon wants to jump in on this one, is that the item that is referenced here um, will not exist? The three steps that are referenced that there'll be ramps. No, there'll be three okay. steps, but they, they have a, uh, an elevator that can go in, up the different zone, so the different distances. Yeah. So, but basically, the answer is that the, in the inspection services department has to make sure that the building is fully compliant with the ADA, um, and they can't approve a design. And then the designers all know this; they know they have to comply with ADA. And there are different ways they can comply. They, you know, they looked at ramps and they looked at keeping the steps and having the the elevator move up a few feet, depending on where people want to go. And if you need, you know, if you know town hall, for instance, our our elevator goes down about five feet to the lower level and then comes up to the ground floor and then goes up to the first floor. So it has a, you know, there's five steps to get to the basement of our building, but there's that, the main street entrance is about five feet up. So the the elevator goes both, in both hits both floors. And then there was the whole question of parking. Yeah. So this is one that came from, um, I'm not sure if you wrote this, Bob, or if Chris Brestrup wrote it. Um, I believe Chris wrote this because it comes within yeah. the context of the planning board approval. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so Chris looked at this question um, and addressed what, what she surmised would be the response of the planning board, but it will be a planning board decision in terms of um, do you have to, you know, there's usually a, a minimum number of um, parking spaces required, but that can be alleviated, uh, especially given that the location of this project is in the center of town. There isn't available space. There's a municipal parking lot across the street and one not far uh, um, north of the project and that there's uh, ready access to bus and other transportation options. Andy? Yeah, I raised my hand because I had a related question to that. Um, there's also parking requirements in the Board of Library Commissioners regulations that are less than um, in our zoning regulations. And I'm assuming, uh, but maybe I wanted to confirm it, that that's really between the architect and library and the um, Board of Library Commissioners as to whether what we've done is satisfactory to um, their regulation. Yep. I don't know the answer to that, Andy. We can look into that. That's a good question, though. If if that is the State Board of Library Commissioners, I know that they have been looking at this project almost continuously. Yeah. And the architect. Yes, they, they do have regulations, and they have a regulation that talks about parking expectations with their the, projects. Uh, so so the MBLC has received plans all along the way. They, re they require us to give them plans every step of the way. And so they've had access to all the plans that designer. So I assume that they would raise issues if they had, haven't by now. Athena, uh, Sharon Sherry has her hand raised. Could you bring her in? Oh, good. I didn't know Sharon was here. She's coming in. Sharon, you should be able to unmute. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Yeah, so when we applied back in 2016-2017, um, as part of the application, they want to make sure that every library applying for these projects is taking parking into consideration. Because, of course, ideally, we would have countless numbers of dedicated uh, parking spots for, for every library across the state. But uh, as everybody knows, you know, uh, we're smack dab in the center of downtown Amherst. So, um, you know, the MBLC takes our our project and sees that uh, we cannot fit X number of parking spaces on our property. But what we have instead are our town parking spots in the vicinity of. And so um, just the fact that they gave us the $13.8 million grant application, that's when they accepted our parking plan. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, Lynn. No, Kathy has her hand up. Okay. And Sharon, I just have a quick question. My memory when I read it is you were counting the parking lot in front of Town Hall, which, as you may have observed, is disappearing. Is that correct? Uh, so what we did when we applied was just showed the MBLC, here are all the different parking lots that are available in the town. Um, but it didn't, it didn't come, you know, we weren't accepted or rejected based on, on the availability of those parking spots. Um. Timing and planning department review. Uh, this was a question asked. We did not do anything like this before the school. Um, and it is a council question. Um, but at this point, uh, the planning department has been engaged in many ways. The whole next section is about the stretch code. And I think, Bob, you probably answered most of this. And uh, it is it does take effect. And from my understanding is the stretch code has been included in the estimates for the addition and, rep and uh, renovation, but it has not been included in the estimates for repair. You are correct. Okay, thank you. Um, then the whole next thing is the whole thing about indebtedness. And much of that was answered above and or is answered here. And um, including a sheet that basically gives some sense of that. Paul or Holly or Jen, did either one of you want to speak to this? Well, I think the 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 new chart you showed really addressed most of the question, most of the content of these questions, and if that's being included in the packet. That should be sort of an addendum to this report. Okay, we'll make sure it goes into the final one. Um, and then uh, if the library very project fails. What are likely demands on town resources for repair of the existing building and what would the timing be for that work and the need for funds? Um, this is a what if question and it's also a, it depends. I answered the question in part, other people contributed to it. Uh, it's up to the library trustees, would they come to the town? for uh, money, I can't imagine they wouldn't. Uh, and uh, would they ask for as much cost as possible? Yes. I do wanna mention that we've already clarified that none of the existing grants and none of the existing donations are for the purpose of repair. They would all go away. And then the next one is, will a council decision to not increase the debt authorization affect federal, state, and charitable support for future town initiatives? And I regret we didn't ask Mindy Dom to join us today because she gives a much more clear answer on this that basically says you'll damage down the road in serious ways uh, because 
and and I use the example here or the example was used here with the MSBA project uh, where the town did reject the first project. And even though I think we are going to end up with a magnificent and beautiful, wonderful, um, energy efficient school, it's costing us almost double what we would have paid before. And what had to be done to repair the relationship with Mass School Building Authority was without question. And that took an effort of a lot of people, including our legislators. The bottom line is when you ask people to go out and get money for you, and then you turn around and don't accept it, they don't want to do it for you again. Bernie? I, I think that, yeah, the lesson here is, is that uh, Amherst uh, represents maybe one half of 1% of the state's population. We need to keep that in mind. Um, every year, the legislature passes uh, debt issues that um, uh, don't don't get uh, don't get put in place. Uh, so each agency, each state agency that has uh, grants to offer, is bumping up against a long list of applicants and a limited supply of funds. Uh, so especially, this is particularly true with uh, with the libraries. So when you turn something down. Um, People are not inclined to go ahead and say, well, you can try again. Uh, and it's important that we, uh, we maintain this uh, uh, good standing with the state in terms of being able to use the money that we're, we're uh, given, whether it's uh, uh, through state aid, whether it's a grant, whether it's a, a special purpose program. Having done, having actually given out state money, we we'll, you know, that stuff gets looked at. Uh, and it gets looked at very hard, uh, you know. So being a reliable partner in this, these projects are uh, is, is of critical importance. I guess I would add to that a couple things. One is that the MBLC process and the MSBA process are very different mm -hmm. in how they proceed. The MSBA process has a, essentially an annual opportunity to apply to get into the process so that uh, there was the opportunity uh, to turn around after the final decision was made with the first school proposal of the Wildwood site to come back into the um, and file an application. And within several years, we were able to get in because of an, uh, some very strong uh, relationships we pushed on on our end, but as uh, Lynn pointed out, the cost ended up being different for other reasons. The, uh, and the, the Board of Library Commissioners process, um, they essentially develop a list and then work off the list for a long period of time so that it can take years before an opportunity comes up to even ask again and you get all of the the things that have been previously pointed out about why it would be difficult. Um, once uh, the process opens, it's a multi-step process to get in. And I know this because uh, you know when I first became chair of the original finance committee, the one that was a committee of town meeting, uh, that was about when we started the process, and it took a long time to ever get to the stage that we're at. Uh, we would have to do the investment in repairs that's been previously discussed. So, you know, that the whole process is so different, you, you just can't uh, put the two together. And uh, I also point to how long it's taken Shootsbury. Uh, who has gone through this on the library process and everything that I described kind of comes back uh, with how long it took Shrewsbury to get back to where they are now. Uh, so Lynn, that, that was my comment. Are there any other comments here? Uh, and then we, to some extent, have addressed this, but I want to make sure that uh, if anybody from the library trustees has further comments, uh, 
This is the issue about the fundraising goal. And if it's not met, is there a consequence for library operations? Uh, my understanding is that uh, the trustees are trying to do everything to make sure that is not the case. And they have a clear understanding that the town is not a source for additional operating money above what we percentage wise do for every other branch of government in town. Is there any other comment on that one? And then uh, we discussed the MOU earlier and there may be some point that the MOU um, between the town and the um, um, needs to be uh, amended, but right now um, it's a matter of interpretation. I'm sorry, these weren't italicized. Okay. I'm gonna take this down for the moment, okay. So I guess the question for us to the committee is whether there are any questions uh, that you want to pursue based upon the information that's just been presented that you did, did not raise previously. Seeing no requests, uh, I uh, feel like we we did do public comment. I'm going to leave it to the committee. If if somebody from the committee wants to recommend that we reopen public comment, we may turn it to a committee vote uh, because I don't think that it's uh, one that I would want to make solely. I see no one from the committee who's uh, suggesting that we return to public comment. Um, Alicia? Um, well, I'm okay with another public comment if there are people who want to public comment. But I wasn't sure if we were actually voting on that. Sorry, Andy, for the delay. Uh, Let me just get a uh, show of hands from the committee. This isn't the formal motion, but uh, if you're opposed to going back to public comment, uh, it would be helpful to at least have some indication. Otherwise, uh, I will go back and hearing no objections, then uh, I think there, it, let me get everybody who's in the audience who wishes, I know there's two hands up. Is there anybody else? Um, then I want to um, honor our general policy of trying to allow public comment. Um, try and limit your public comments, please, to two minutes because we think we need to move them along. But um, why don't we start with... Uh, uh, Tony, since she's first in on the list. Um, Tony, go ahead, please. Hi, thanks so much for the second opportunity to speak. Uh, this has been really helpful. Um, regarding the model, I was wondering if you can actually share the model itself so that we could use, like put our own inputs in. I think that was what was promised a few years ago. Uh, so you could put in different estimates for costs of projects, different interest rates and so on and timing so that we can actually play with it ourselves. Um, as far as the authorized debt, thank you so much, Holly, for creating that um, spreadsheet or Jennifer. I It doesn't jive with what I found on the data bank and I'm not exactly sure why. So maybe somebody could help me understand that. So the data bank has authorized debt at $205 million and unissued debt at $164 million. So the difference being $40 million issued. So um, I, I understand that Centennial and the other water things are excluded and the schools excluded, but it still doesn't seem to add up to the same numbers as are on the state's website. So I'm just curious why that is. Um, on the fundraising, uh, thanks to those that were trying to clarify whether the fundraising, the capital campaign expenses are um, 
on the library or on the town. Um, my interpretation of the first MOA was similar to what Alicia was getting at, that the, sh the library share you know, was set at 5.6 million and that fundraising costs could be deducted from that before giving the balance to the town, which in effect meant the town was paying for the fundraising. So if that's not the case, that's fantastic. I'd love that to be more clear in the MOA because um, I'm obviously interpret interpreting it wrong then and maybe other people would too. But that's great that the, that the 1 million fundraising expenses is in addition to the library share effectively. Um, as long as the library is aware that they're raising another million dollars. And then the cash flow. Um, so I've been hearing 2027 a uh, number of times, but the cash flow presented doesn't show any payment from the library in 2027, unless I'm reading it wrong. It looks like the last payment from the library is July 2026. So that's, is that in fact, what Bob Pam is expecting that the, everything is paid by July 2026 and nothing in 2027. Um, and if that's not the case, then I guess the cash flow should reflect another year of borrowing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I don't know if uh, Paul or anybody, but has anything to say about the uh, uh, memorandum of fund agreement, the MOA. Uh, I think that I had, Lynn, I had interpreted it differently, but you go ahead. I, I wasn't going to speak to it. I want to make sure that people understand the difference between calendar year and fiscal year. Fiscal year 2027 um, is July 31st. And so Maria Kapuki. Hi, Maria. Thank you. The really late edition of a really complicated bunch of information really um, doesn't inspire confidence. Um, there were a lot of things that still haven't been produced and what has been produced really needs to be vetted and digested. And I hope that the finance committee and the town councilors spend a lot of time looking at the numbers. I want to comment specifically about what was finally said out loud at this meeting, which is the willingness of the town manager and some town councilors to dip into the capital stabilization fund. When we were talking about the school project, you would have thought that we were literally trying to take bricks from the fire department. The way that you said, absolutely not. You must not touch this capital stabilization fund. We have to have that. That has to grow. If we don't grow this, we're not going to have a fire station. And here we are with inevitable results from the numbers that we're looking at, that if you authorize this borrowing, the chances of you going to that capital stabilization fund to cover routine and unexpected capital expenses because you've tied up so much money in debt is extremely high. And the fact that you're not showing that same degree of concern now for the fire station that you did just a few months ago is while not unexpected, extremely concerning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I know that the, uh, there are a couple of counselors still in the audience, and I assume if they had questions that they wanted to ask, if they didn't feel our questions were asked, that they would raise their hands. So I've uh, pausing just to point that out and just in case any of them wants to and I'll in the meantime recognize Kathy. Um, yeah, I I just printed out memorandum of agreement number one, which is the 2021 one and memorandum supplement memorandum. And I definitely think it needs to be redone because it still has the old numbers in it. Um, you know, so the the library amount 
MBLC is up. Um, so the cover page and then clarity. Um, and the um, I I haven't really carefully looked at the rest of it, Paul, but just uh, just trying to update all the numbers. So we are clear what the library share was. We were very clear in the first one that the library share was X. Um, and that's what we've been focusing on. And um, once we did CPA and MBLC. So I think at a minimum, we need to update the numbers in it and then clarifying that that's the amount of money they be given to us. And I, the other, I, I, I very much appreciate that the trustees, Bob and others have gone to the banks so I don't know whether we can write in the assurance that they would take out a loan against the uh, their endowment fund as needed to make us whole by X date. You know, the dates here, we said they're putting the endowment up as a security. Um, so it's just, I, I just I just think we need to tighten it a little bit because we, we don't own the building. Um, we, we can't have the building be collateral. So, I'm not suggesting specific pieces here, but it's still it still says their obligation on one of it says their obligation is five million or the number. So it's some combination of the two. Um, that that's it. That's the only thing. I I don't think that affects the way I I think about the whole project right now. I just think that my ultimate vote on this authorization is also going to rely on a a tightly written updated MOA. Um, so I, so I wanted to make because it the original one, I think we all understood they were on the hook for the money if I use the that, you know, with an endowment. And it really seemed reasonable with an endowment of eight and a gap of five where they were expecting to get another two from historic credits. Um, now the gap is bigger and nearer to the total endowment. And while I think they might be able to raise it, I just think we should write it write it tighter that that's my my thoughts on the moa and maybe i'm looking at the wrong version of it i just printed out 2021 and 2022 so um that's it yeah yeah so i guess i have a question for the committee now um uh, we've been talking about this for multiple meetings Pamela has her hand up as a counselor. Oh, I'm sorry. Pam, I did say, and, and thank you, Lynn, for keeping an eye on the list, but please bring Pam in. So, Pam, we want to make sure that your questions have been thank addressed you. while we still have the people here. Uh, I don't want to be joined as a panelist. I just was going to speak. Does it matter? Okay. You're you're not a panelist. You can go ahead, Pam. Pam, I think you muted yourself. No, I came in as a panelist. Uh, thank you. So I uh, I also misunderstood the MO, MOA statement about um, contributions to the from the library minus the Fees, and I think that could be just better English. Just say the 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 library will not charge the um, will not will pay, will cover all costs, including their own fundraising fees. It's it's just not good English. Um, the other question that just did not get answered was uh, going to page two of three. And it was item number four. Again, the town's decision to proceed with the project past the bidding phase may occur under the following circumstances. A, town council appropriates funds and B, the town manager determines that in, in their sole discretion that the project is financially feasible. I did not hear the answer to, is the town manager authorized by this MOA to in fact authorize the borrowing uh, or to um, 
authorize the borrowing to proceed with this project. Thank you. Lynn, do you want to respond to that or do you want? I certainly would look to Paul. My understanding is the town council has to authorize the yeah. ability to borrow. The town manager then signs the actual borrowing documents. Yeah, it's a two-step process. One is the council appro approves the funding, and then the cat the second catch is for the mm -hmm. town manager to determine if the fundraising has been achieved at the level that we think we can move forward on it. We, but it, it the first step is for the council to vote. If the council doesn't vote, the town manager has no authority to borrow or any, do anything. Okay, yeah, so thank you. Um, Alicia. Um, I just wanted to confirm that we're not actually taking a vote on this today, just because I, I do have to leave the meeting. So I was actually, just I was just about to ask that question, which is, um, so that we can clear the deck and get on to our other business uh, at the next meeting, including the uh, fees for the uh, re rental registration and the guidelines for FY25 to see if we have, um, if there's, a, um, if the committee's comfortable with going ahead with motions. Is there any uh, anybody who would not want to uh, get to motions after the substantial discussion today? Hearing nobody say anything, um, I will proceed and put some motions on the table. Um, but before I do so, I just want to make uh, one statement on my own behalf, and um, that is that um, I think it's known that uh, my wife works uh, part-time, uh, really just an afternoon a week for the um, one of the branch libraries, and uh, I have uh, it on file with the clerk um, a notice that um, I have consulted with the State Ethics Commission about this. Um, and uh, based upon the advice and information and my own uh, study of the state ethics rules, that there is no um, conflict. And in my capacity as municipal employee, um, I am expected to uh, take certain actions in performance of my official duties as a circumstance as a reasonable person uh, would conclude that um, there's no conflict of interest given that um, her employment is unrelated to what we're discussing and that um, therefore um, I am permitted to, to vote on motions relating to the capital funding discussion that is underway. And uh, that notice has has been filed and has been filed for several years uh, uh, because of uh, the, the same issue was on my mind two years ago and is on my mind now. And uh, I have... Uh, based upon the advice I've received, feel comfortable with it. So with that, I'm going to uh, do two motions uh, today. Um, and uh, the first one is actually one that arose out of today's discussion. Um, and this, uh, I think, a, uh, and then I'll have a second one, but I move that uh, the Finance Committee recommends that the town manager seek amendments to the uh, memorandum of agreement um, as he deems necessary to assure clarity about the expectations of the parties to the agreement. Second. Is there any discussion on that particular motion? Can can we just, as a friendly amendment, um, add 
including updating the numbers, you know, updating the obligations. Yeah. Maybe uh, that's fine with me. Okay. So um, the added language. Um, And I'll read the motion again, including um, where, how do you want to say clarity about the. Just, just to read the whole thing, there was a place I think you just said, including updating the numbers. So figure out what, because between the two, just so I'm clear, the very first one had a specific amount that they were obligated to come up with. That was the subtraction of everything else. We don't have that. So that's the number, you know, when all is said and done at the end of the day. So in, including updating the obligations, updating the numbers. But I mean, Paul, you've got it in the authorization. You have it, uh, you know, minus MBLC, minus CPA, minus whatever. But I just want to make it clear what the obligation is. Mm -hmm. so, Andy, that's all. I just want to add those words, figure out how it goes into your wording. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, re read it again, see if you think it's right, which is I move that the Finance Committee recommends that the town manager seek amendments to the memorandum of agreement as he deems necessary to assure clarity about the expectations of the parties to the agreement, including updating the amounts of obligations. And That's I agree as the seconder to that. That's fine. Thank you. So that is the motion then that is on the floor. So I'm going to just go alphabetically as I normally do. Um, and uh, so, Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Uh, Bob Hegner? I support. <clears throat> Matt? Support. Bernie. Support. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia. No. So the motion is um, with four counselors in favor, one opposed, and three resident members in support. And the motion carries. The second motion is um, I move that the Finance Committee recommend Town Council approve the motion requested by the Town Manager in his November 9, 2023 memorandum to the Council, a request for a supplemental appropriation and bond authorization for the Jones Library. Second. Yeah, there's a motion that's been made and seconded on the floor for discussion. Is there any request for additional discussion? Seeing no request for additional discussion, we'll, um, as I do normally, go to the next person, which is Lynn. Aye. Bob. I support. Matt. Support. Bernie. Support. Kathy. Abstain. I'm a yes. Alicia. No. Lila. Aye. So the vote on that is three yes, one no, one abstention, and three resident members in support. And Andy, to the extent you want to explain my abstention, um, I need to see the whole package. So with the MOA, it matters to me how we guard against risk. So I'm not a no. Um, but if you need wording on why did I say abstain? Okay. Um, and of course, uh, the reason I made the first motion first is to... Um, give uh, the town manager the opportunity to uh, negotiate uh, modifications to the MOA before bringing this back to the council. 
uh, Lynn, your hand is up. That's exactly what I want to clarify, and that is that the town manager would do, uh, hopefully be able to do that in time for this to come before the council on the 4th of December. Okay. So, um, I had, I proposed that uh, it's now uh, we're two hours and 15 minutes that we um, use our Friday afternoon meeting to discuss the other two issues of substance on the agenda. Uh, I don't think that uh, this committee probably has the energy to want to take on the, the next item, which is the rental registration fee structure. So I would propose we we uh, go to adjournment. I have nothing that was uh, uh, new business. Kathy, I did. I just have a quick comment. I sent you this morning. I marked up the draft guidelines, budget guidelines from a year ago, and red lines with comments. So are we still? We're we're not. I should ask it as a question. Are we trying to? to get a draft to the December 4th meeting, or have we moved that to a later date? I think we probably moved it to a later date, but I, um, uh, with your consent, um, I will um, put that in the packet. Okay, because I, I did, I, I went all the way through it, um, updating numbers, and then when I inserted or deleted, I put a comment on why I had done something. So I, if you put it in as a Word document, that people will be able to see the redlining in the comments. I'm fine with sharing it if you're fine with sharing it. A few things it says, this is Kathy's opinion. <laughs> so it's, yes. you know, if, if, it was, I, I if, might if, it, if it was a new thought, you know. And I, and I might actually work on this, do the same thing tomorrow. Um, and others from the committee are welcome to do so also uh, because it'll create the points for the opportunities for discussion. And uh, okay. so I will uh, uh, do the same thing and invite others, but I will send them out. Uh, they will be, when they get posted, when you uh, uh, take a document like that with red lines, I think that when you save it to PDF, it saves with those changes shown. And uh, so if it does, then it will be visible for all, uh, even people who um, cannot get to the SharePoint package which, because the posted packet does not have the uh, ability to put Word documents into it. So that said, I think that uh, we have nothing more for today and we can adjourn. So I'll declare the meeting adjourned at uh, 20 after four. Thanks everybody. Thanks.